too. Um, again, I'm going to say the question, and then you guys can just kind of take off from, uh, from it. So, okay. Question number two is this. What does the phrase open heaven really mean? Just, let's just kind of boil it down to just a simple type of thing. Because some people are going to go, I have no idea what you're talking about. But let's, let's try to make it very um, simplistic for somebody. Let's just say okay. they're a newcomer. My simplistic would be it's, it's basically a intimate relationship of commune with the Lord where he entrusts us with the things of his heart. Now, there's many tenets you could go off on that, but I mean, that's, he's showing us what he's doing and what he wants to do in us mm -hmm. and the nations on this earth. Mm -hmm. And in regards to making the earth function the way heaven functions. Okay. Yep. Yep. And those are those are really really great, and and see you you know you get a different flavoring of how um, it it's hard to boil it down into one simplistic thing like that because it's so massive, right? Uh, but the the gist of it does include that. Yes, Pastor Larry, do you have something you want well, to add to it? It's like she said. It's it's about communing with the Father and sharing uh, His passion for restoring his footstool you know this this earth was made to uh you know showcase his glory and uh, uh things have not gone that way because of the what the enemy is doing and the enemy has absconded with the glory and we're taking it back and so this process of partnering with the father for this purpose is being in this open heaven yes yep and that's 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 really true i mean you, you talked about restoration we talked about the um the open um intimate relationship with god that we have um and and those are those are those are great that's that's, that's those are easy ways for uh, people to really grasp it and so i'm going to just add to that you know when i was thinking about this i was thinking lord there, Man, you could write volumes and volumes of things about what what an open heaven really means. But the first scripture that came to mind when whenever I was thinking about this was uh, in Luke 11, verse 2, that where, where, where Jesus is teaching us how to pray. And, you know, he's teaching us how to pray. And towards the end of that, that verse, it, it says, on earth as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. And so I started thinking about that term and, I, you know. I, I jotted down this this is this is my way to add on to what Pastor Larry and Vicky have already said and everything that we we're gonna say is is correct. But in its simplest terms I just wrote the realities of heaven manifesting on earth. Amen. Yes. And, Very good. Um that is a lot. <laughs> I mean yeah. what you guys have said, what I just said is wow, what we have a um, we have a heavenly calling, and I, and I know the scripture refers to that in the book of Hebrews. Mm -hmm. And so let's talk a little bit about that further. Realities of heaven manifesting on earth. What? Um, and and let's, uh, the first thing I guess I'll say is I want to link it directly to Luke one Luke eleven verse two. This begins it all. It starts, and I think it's very interesting. Of uh, in a timing issue and in a content issue of what when Jesus is t telling his disciples this he's he's not telling them this principle, you know. Eight, nine, ten months into into the ministry you know, uh, being launched, he's he's talking from almost from the very beginning to them. This is one of the most important things you need to focus on. Here's the pattern, and he, and here's the connective, and he says you pray our Father, you you know you. You, you address the heavenly father that's in heaven. There's heaven again. Mm -hmm. And he said, focus on the hallowedness or the holiness that's in his name. His kingdom comes will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I mean, right. what do you guys think about that? Speak I to that. I think it's interesting that I can remember in Bible college hearing that the temple 
was a type of heaven, T-Y-P-E, as in a, um, a foreshadowing of, of what's going on in heaven, heaven. And yet no one ever explained what that really was, what the connection was. Mm-hmm. I'm not, they knew what it was. They, and, they probably didn't. And no one ever, ever said that we could be functioning in that now. Mm-hmm. So limit it to just what you saw occurring in the natural temple on the earth, which, of course, we immediately said we're no longer under the law, so we don't function in that. So it was it was kind of this roundabout thing that never really got resolved. Mm-hmm. But when you when you realize that we are supposed to be ministering, as you said, we're seated in our heavenly seats, but we're supposed to be ministering in those places in the heavens. And when we do that, the results of that, you can call it residue, but the result of what our work accomplishes is intended for earth. For instance, in the in the TTT, the Temple of the Tabernacle of Testimony, mm-hmm. that's like uh, the governing aspect of the will of the Lord. And when you're in there praying, and there's many saints that have gone before us that are there praying to join us in partnership, the results of that prayer is manifesting on earth. Now, it's not going to be seen in the way man's looking for it to be manifested. Mm-hmm. Because it's a spiritual thing that's that's being implemented. And it's a an alignment that's taking place in the spiritual realm that's not really seen with human eyes. And part of that's just faith as well, you know, is accepting <laughs> that. I mean, here we go again. It's, it goes off into so many different aspect of sure. this. But we 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 know, we are convinced that that what we're doing is having impact and making uh, its magnitude on this earth. Because the earth the scripture says the earth is crying out for sons to to be made manifest and to do their part, take their responsibility so that the earth can begin to function the way it knows it was created to function. Mhm. Okay, you, let me, can I ask you a question? I want I want to piggyback off of something you said. You mentioned the eye that, and we we've all said this term, but just for the sake of someone that has gotten this uh, podcast, and they they hear this and they go, "There's there's a lot of talk about sons. What exactly are we talking about there? When when, when we use that term, what what does that mean?" For somebody that's new to this, I know it's it's hard to imagine somebody being in the family. <laughs> but what, what speak to that for just a minute, if you if you if you if you don't mind. Well, a son is actually just giving yourself over to the design of the Father. It's it's allowing him to ignite the identity that he's placed within us to partner through our our words to partner through diverse intercession to to speak the the languages of of maybe many nations but also of angelic tongues mm-hmm. in order to bring about the will of the father he's he's got definite designs definite uh intents that that he wants accomplished on this earth and we partner with him to do that it that's kind of in a nutshell but really, a son is somebody who has, be, has moved past the infancy stage, mm-hmm. um, and so and is, so you so you mean there's growth involved? Is that yeah? They're, okay. they're hungry. They're hungry to know the father. I, I guess at the very crux of it is to know the father deeper, and and to accept all that goes with that because a father is not going to turn over the family business to somebody who's still in the crib drinking milk. Right. I don't mean that as a, a cutting no. anyone. I was there for many, many, many years. We, we, we all were, yep. Um, but someone who has realized God's got something much higher. He's got mm-hmm. a level of inheritance for me to be living in now yes. and take responsibility for now along with the angelic partnership to to actually make a difference on this earth and make my life count for something very credible that lasts through eternity. That for sure. Well it, spoken. It's learning the business, basically. 
It's kingdom learning, business. It's yeah. learning kingdom business and, and understanding what God was doing in the beginning and taking up that um, uh, commissioning that Jesus had. And, you know, when the scripture says that we're going to do greater works than Jesus, it doesn't mean that our miracles are going to be better than his. It means that we are going to expand on what he began. We're going to continue the work uh, that he was doing, and he was working as unto the Father, uh, and only doing what the Father told him to do. And he said, I am, you know, he was the son. And we are being adopted into this position of sons so that we will function and work as Jesus did in a greater um, expanse then uh, then Jesus he was focused mainly with Israel so, and when Paul and uh, you know Peter began to do their ministry it was to the Gentiles mm-hmm. as they were doing a greater work than Jesus as they expanded the ministry uh, and Jesus said I'm going to send you into into the into the world with this and so it's not just going to be here in Jerusalem but it's going to go out and, and so this is about us participating in that going out. Could I insert a scripture here that really impacted Absolutely. When I first came in this walk. It's found in John 1.12. And it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Mm. Yeah. I, I never thought about sonship growing up. But in reading this, it's like it's not automatically there. It's something that becomes. And that word become is genomai. And it really speaks. It really, if you follow it back, it goes back to the essence of our identity, of who Jesus. God wants us to be. Yeah. And Chinos, yes. And it's really, it's the eternal intent of God for us to become sons, to grow into mature sons. Mm-hmm. And, you know, other verses scre- uh, uh, address that as not staying infants, not staying on the milk, but desiring deep meat, you know, strong meat. You notice that, meat. that scripture said to the believers. He, he gave this power. So these people really were believing that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. They were believing that God was in control. And um, they needed to go further. They need to go to further. This is the son. command to go further. This is the directive to go further, to mature, uh, and to take on the responsibility that God is showing us, not only through his word, but in our uh, communion with him, there are going to be things that, that he's going to bring up to us that are going to be needing to be done at that point. And so we're taking responsibility for those things and functioning uh, on behalf of um, you know, what he's doing. And along with that, he reveals revelatory truths that we have the opportunity and invitation to embrace at every point along the way. And that, that really crowds out the iniquity within us. It doesn't leave a lot of room for it. The more you add truth and and embrace this aspect of who we're to be, the less room there is for any of us (laughs) that doesn't need to be there, if that makes sense. And that's part of that daily dying to self type of thing. You know, and and this is probably a very poor illustration, but I like it. (laughs) (laughs) So he's going to use it. (laughs) But... but, uh, uh, you know, when a sculptor, uh, whether he's working in clay or stone, um, he, he has a vision of what that piece is supposed to look like. And uh, God looks at us with this same vision. He, he has a pattern of who we are supposed to be fully vested sons in heaven. And so it is our privilege or it's our job it's it's our assignment is to find out or to be to grow and and this is through the power of the spirit into that pattern that's already in heaven of who we are we have an identity in heaven before the throne our names are written on the father's hand um he 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 looks at us and sees our sees us in our spirit in, in, in the fullness of who we are supposed to be. And so our life here on earth is a process of, of coming into that so that we actually become on earth as we are in heaven. And I think that's, uh, um, that, that just speaks to that need for us to always press 
uh, ourselves into um, knowing God, knowing His heart, uh, knowing because in knowing His ways, because He's 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 in the process of, of growing us to that point where we we match what we are in heaven. <laughs> yeah. when we come before the throne of God. That's who we are supposed to be. So, so in other words, He's He's revealing to us his identity for us amen amen and amen. And, and as he reveals that then we as a people as a church as mm-hmm. a as a city as a nation i mean it, it, i like the expansiveness of this because this is it, this is very personal but yet it's very corporate it's very god mm-hmm. wants cities to function this way he wants nations to function this way and so what we're proposing here is not really some some off the wall concept here or reality. We're talking about the the way God the way God views us and how He's I, He He wants us to function this way, and it all goes back to His identity for all of us. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be very similar, you know, when we're talking about. Uh, the identity of a, of, a, of, a, of a saint's church or the and then and then versus the identity of a an individual I mean there's similarities but then there's going to be different aspects of that as well but mm-hmm. that's the beauty of a many membered body you know there's there's all kinds of different ways that it's supposed to function you know but um, man we could we could go on and on and I'm right. jotting down notes because there's you know these could be other other types of episodes and and things of that sort so um you know we're still talking about the question you know what what does that phrase mean and hopefully if you haven't gained any meaning from this wow i i really we really need to pray for you because there there are some nuggets that we we've, we've all shared because you know i think about um i we I'm gonna I'm gonna mention a few terms here, and then we'll 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 talk about those, and then move on, because wow, we're already in an hour. <laughs> um, I'm game if you guys are. I just don't want to take take any more of your time. But um, when you look at the, the the Greek term in the New Testament for open, one of the one of the first things you, you, you we always do. I say we can because I know Pastor Larry, Vicky do do this, and we're, we're trained to do this, is to go into the Scripture and look at it in the greek and you know the hebrew if it's the old testament you know the the word for open um that is in connection with heaven opening is is the term where we get the word portal or an entrance and it refers to something that's opening up or 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 something that's closing Mm -hmm. and and so that's the terminology that god is using and i anytime i've been able to to be in this mode, it's like this dimension that we that we live in. There, it's like there's a layer over the spiritual dimension, mm-hmm. and and that layer, layer one, which is the earthly realm, is just peeled back, and once that layer is removed, O M G. <laughs> at what can be seen beyond that that layer that and that's really it, it's a peeling back mm-hmm. but it really it's an opening i'm just using the word peel to kind of give you a picture of what can happen and that that's so that's what he's saying so when john says in revelation 4 a door was opened in heaven that's what he's referring to that's the term is mm-hmm. this this entrance this thing that was peeled back was opened up for me Um, and then, um, the second term that I want to mention, we're talking about vision here because when heaven opens, vision is going to (laughs) come. That's just part of it is, is a Greek term. There's, there's a Greek term that when it's mentioned when he, when Nathaniel, here's another example for you. If you need a new Testament reference, Nathaniel said, Jesus spoke this over him. This was his identity. Pastor Larry, he said, hereafter, you're going to see heaven open now we just came out of a greater works seminar several weeks back but part of that is seeing an open heaven 
Mm-hmm. And the word, the Greek word for see there is, is the word optanomai. And it's where we get our word ophthalmology or ophthalmologist. And it's, and it's obviously a vision, visionary term. And this is one of many in, in the New Testament. But this one means to gaze with wide open eyes at something that's absolutely remarkable. Right. This is the highest visionary capacity that anyone on this earth can have. And there's different types of seeing. And it's an interesting study. If you go and you study the different types of seeing in the New Testament, you'll find different words and they have different meanings. But this one here is an open visionary with eyes wide open, being able to see beyond the earthly realm and through an opening that God allows. Now, this is not something anybody can turn on and off when they want to this that is not this this is god activating it when he wants it done or he wants you to see something i think that's very much what stephen was involved with yeah (laughs) exactly so those two terms let's kind of touch on that just for a minute um what you guys have any thoughts about the term for open and the the term the term for see there what what do you think well um the 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 openness is is really our invitation to you know when when John looked up and he, and he saw the the door it the invitation was come up come up and and and, and enter in I want to show you some things that are going to have to happen or that have happened and I believe this is always God's invitation when when there is a vision when there is that opening. Uh, into the reality of, of the spirit realm, it, it's not just for entertainment. It's not just to uh, uh, bring some sort of uh, an anomaly that will, you know, that, that can be uh, capitalized on. It is an invitation for personal involvement with God uh, to uh, to be ready for something. There, there's always a, a a launch from that that's supposed to be taking place and. And to to assign it uh, as, just as a curiosity uh, is to miss that opening. And he wants us to come up. He wants us to come in. Uh, I was thinking about uh, John. Uh, you know, when, when he baptized Jesus, uh, he looked up and saw the dove descending. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was that invitation to uh, acknowledge that this was the Son of God. This this was the one he had been preaching about, uh, and to follow him, and uh, uh, you know when when he sent word to Jesus to say you know um, are you the one or should we look for another? Uh, it was it wasn't I don't believe that John was um, uh, not believing. Uh, I, it was more like is this the time where I send my disciples to you? You know. Yeah, is it is it time now? Is is this when we do it? And mm-hmm. I think that's really what the the uh, impetus behind that question was. Um, and um, you know, it, it's like when Jesus was in the garden, and uh, he said, you know, Father, you know, if this is the right time, you know, if there's another way. Right. And it wasn't that he was looking for another way. It was just that he was he was confirming that this was the time. This was when it was supposed to happen. And uh, uh, the scriptures just give us a little insight into the communication that he had with the Father and how he was always not assuming anything, but he was only doing what the Father said. And so this is what John's uh, you know, question was all about. Is this the time where we, where we now, you know, all my disciples go to you? And that was at that point that there, uh, two of John's disciples actually went and uh, started to hang with Jesus. <laughs> That, that, that's an interesting uh, exchange of words there. We could, we could, we could really go with that. But to, to stay the course here, <laughs> no, yeah. th- those are some really good points. I mean, you know, for for those of you that are, are maybe you, you've you've just joined for some reason, we've already talked about. We mentioned Stephen. Uh, Vicky mentioned Stephen, the example of him in the New Testament. We've looked at Nathaniel. Now we brought in another person, John the Baptist, and it's these are individuals that that um, encountered this open heaven in extraordinary ways. 
So I think when Mark, when when the heavens are opened in this way, I think we also see very um, I don't know well transitional things that occur as well. You think about Peter. There's another example of he was up praying on the rooftop. And of course, that's another aspect. <laughs> it was linked into all of this. But um, he was praying on the rooftop and saw this vision. He actually, it says he saw heaven opened mm -hmm. and the feet let down. And the whole, the whole crux of that entire occurrence after it went back up and, and it, the heavens were closed again was it was ushering in the Gentiles. It was ushering in the message of the saints, the message of the kingdom, to be preached to the Gentiles. And that was monumental. Oh, yeah. It was prophesied about way back, but it was still monumental because that, I think most of the, a lot of the church, let me put it that way, they read these prophecies and they don't expect that they're going to happen in their lifetime. Mm hmm and it's like, well, what do you think it's going to look like when it happens? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I found myself sharing this with people that I love dearly. And and they just act, you know, they're kind of like, well, that's just bizarre. I'm like, well, what do you think these things are going to look like? I mean, all these things Daniel saw. What do you think that's going to look like in the end times? Right. I mean, it's it's going to happen. We just don't expect it will happen in our lifetime. But here you've got this monumental juncture point of the Gentiles, the heaven basically opening to the Gentiles, mm -hmm. you know, that they didn't have that capacity as a people before. Yeah. Though you, you, you bring up some, that, yeah, it's like some, it, there, there's blinders that, that are over the, 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 the hearts of people. I mean, we could go back to, <laughs> having so many things just come in right now. Um, we could have a discussion just on what you said, and go back to the parable of the, the 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 sower. You know how Jesus is saying there's different types of, of of soil that the seed is being sown. Now, I remember growing up. I, 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 we're referring back because we're learning from our past, so we don't repeat it. That's so. In growing up, a lot of the things that were shared, they they would apply it to. Some very basic elementary applications, I guess, is what I'm saying. Like, like the parable of the sower really didn't apply to us because we're Christians, right? So it's like, <laughs> wait a minute, my heart can get stony, right? right. Can our right. hearts get stony? Right. Oh, absolutely. Can, <laughs> I mean, it's like, and what kind of what you're the, what you're saying? You know, you share this with people, and they they just don't get it. Mm -hmm. And and part of it is part of it is that their heart has not been opened up to enter into it. Yeah. Right. You know, and, and we're, we're in, we're in the days of, of uh, the apostolic where the apostolic message is opening the hearts of Lydia's all over the world. Amen. They mm -hmm. hear it and, and the seed gets in there and then begins to grow and germinate and it causes something revolutionary to come alive. But Lydia, the thing about her is she, had to let that seed take root for it to begin to germinate and, and, and grow. And so that, that's key for what we're talking about here. And it is a foreign concept if, if, if the heart of the person is not open. And to me, the opening of the heart can be this. It, how, how do you know if someone heart, someone's heart is open? If they have a, a slight hunger... Just, I mean, it could be the slightest of hungers for something more. Their heart is opening. It could be, uh, uh, maybe they're, they use terms like, you know, I'm, I'm desperate. I want to know the Lord and I'm desperate. That, that to me signals that the heart is beginning to open up. So I think, uh, and I think the Lord has really trained us all to discern those types of things. I think we, I think you guys, as well as me or others, we don't get it right 100% of the time. But a lot of the time, we can discern, thank, you know, thanks be to God, when somebody is really wanting to know the Lord. Right. Um, you, it, so we have a very um, unique calling, and um, 
We, it's great, though. It, you know, one of the things that I have been thinking about recently is I refuse to focus on allowing the enemy to try to get me to focus on the things that are not happening right. because he'll do that a lot of times and get, try to get us off, off the pathway or get us consumed by that. So I refuse that and I, and I just accept that whatever the Lord's doing and, and I focus on that. Amen. And that, that's putting it in a very simple manner, but you know, and, and I, and I mentioned that because, you know, our walk is, it's great, but there's, there's obstacles that we face that are different than, than, uh, you know, what people in the, the general church face. They don't even think these obstacles are there, or they think you should bind them, rebuke them, and remove them. You know, and, so, and that is a principle. But you know, what do you do? What do you do? This is part of an open heaven, I think, in, in, in an apostolic manner. What do you do when God allows a messenger of Satan to come and buffet you? You can bind it, rebuke it, say I'm not accepting it. But Paul did, and Paul did that. But God said, No, no, I am not removing this thing. I've got, I'm allowing this warfare to happen in order to teach you something and i want to teach you about my overcoming sufficient grace and how Amen. that's what you need in the midst of this Amen. and um so it's principles like that that they are very unpleasant while you're walking through them but boy right. when you come out on the other side you go lord i see what you were doing had i not stayed the course i would not have stepped into this overcoming grace point in my life